okay? Now, I did for victory. There's the plan of my garden. It's a very simple thing. But what I wanted to do when I moved to Brisbane was to prove what my grandparents taught me, that 100 square metres of good soil will feed a person all year round. Dead easy in Australia because you're not dealing with the miserable British climate. You know, I can get two, maybe three crops a year in, in a year. But um, the important thing about doing it here is that you need 10,000 litres of stored water per 100 square metres to do it with elegance during ongoing drought. I get by with 7,000 litres of stored water per square metre. I use one ninth to one forty-fifth of the amount of water that irrigated farming uses to do it. Now you get an idea how 3% of the land in Russia produces 40% of the food that they do. Home gardens are inherently efficient because the labour lives on site, because the site is plumbed in, hopefully, to a rainwater tank. Okay? Now, this is how powerful 300 square metres of soil can be. Just some examples from my open days. This year I had 129 things on my menu. Diversity means that whatever the weather, and whatever my skills are, I will have food on the table. Diversity builds success. I was also able to produce a surplus of 875 jars of jam, which I use for trading. I don't use money all the time. One of the things we forget about when we talk about home food production is the fact it's not just about cash. There's a lot of economic activity that occurs in my place that involves trade. I had 875 jars of jam, 911 packets of surplus seed and 1,800 surplus plants out of my 300 square metres of soil. Small is powerful. During the middle of the drought, I, had a food, uh, uh, I explored another boundary by throwing lunch for 150 people. Four-course meal created by chefs, not by me, uh, out of my food garden just to prove that I could do that and my food garden would continue feeding the household, which is what its job is destined to be. So what it des demonstrates is that you can suddenly increase productivity in a non-destructive way when needs are there. And this is what I've been doing for the last 10 years, exploring boundaries. Small is powerful. One square metre of soil can soak up 176 litres of water, and that's what it looks like. My property, on average, soaks up a million litres of stormwater every year. My garden is part of flood protection as well. No water left my property when Cyclone Marsha came along, and four days later we were filming on that lawn, so that lawn was in good condition. One of the things I talk to is amateur gardeners and everybody knows that you need to use fertilisers in your garden. One of the few things that people realise is how destructive and damaging artificial nitrogen fertilisers are. So I encourage people to use <coughs> natural nitrogen which does not react with the atmosphere because artificial nitrogen does. And when artificial nitrogen reacts with oxygen in the atmosphere, it creates nitrous oxide gas, which is 296 times more polluting a greenhouse gas than CO2. So instead of that, you use simple things like seaweed, blood and bone, and poultry manure. Transition is really simple. You grow different types of crops. I've told you I have a wide variety of them, but the whole idea is you produce things which are durable, sturdy, hardy, and robust. That's what you need. They have to be climate change ready. Uh, here's an idea. I'm sorry about this spread there. Um, but uh, get an idea of how productive you can be. All my vegetable beds are 10 square metres. And so these are the samples of what I've got. I can get 35 kilos of potatoes from 10 square metres or I can get 172 kilos of yams. I mean, it's incredible how you can upscale your food production if you look at it. You can produce your own cultivars and your own land races by saving seed at home. This is a whole story in itself, but literally by using non-hybrid seed, saving seed from your best plants and saving that seed year in, year out, it takes on average five years to localise crops. That's how cool temperate leeks go from being something which can cope in a climate like Melbourne and Tasmania to living in the subtropics. It takes about five years to create them and I did, a, did that and I created a perennial leek. I've created perennial celery in doing it, the options are there. I'm beyond honeybees. Everybody worries about honeybees, but if you've got the right bait,
and you will bring in bees. Wynnum is not a sexy place to live. You know, we've cut down the mangroves so you can look at the mud when the tide goes out. <laughs> our weeds are all throughout our creeks. We have no national parks, and yet I can get 21 species of native bee in my garden, and they do all the pollination for me. I don't know if there are many other things, but I've got to wind up now, but this is the closer. This is the most important thing. The Rodale Institute did a 30-year study between a conventionally managed farm and an organically managed farm in the United States. 30 years, they were able to prove that organic sequesters atmospheric CO2 and it puts it into the soil. Soil is the best bank for CO2, not trees. Trees are good, but soil is better. And that, that happens the very first year you move to low-till farming. When you move to low-till farming, you sequester 7.8 tonnes of CO2 per hectare per year. That works out at 0.78 kilos per square metre. So in my garden, I can sequester in my 300 square metre garden, I can sequester enough carbon to run a car to come down here and talk to you today. Um, and when I'm talking to, to gardeners, that's the best way to look at it. Every square metre of soil, two bathtubs worth of CO2 a year. Now, if Australia were to convert to sustainable farming, and I would suggest that we do, we only have 100,000 family farms left in Australia. When I gave this talk 10 years ago, we had 120,000 family farmers. They are our bottom line land <coughs> army. We should do everything we possibly can to encourage them to up take up sustainable farming because we have 50 million hectares of farmland, we have 50 million hectares of rangeland in Australia, and if that were to move to sustainable agriculture, within a year we would be sequestering 70% of our national greenhouse gas emissions. Add on to that beyond zero carbon Australia and we become a massively successful, well-fed country which is climate positive. Okay? Now, any more questions? I have to leave it now because I've been warned I'm going to be shot if I don't shut up. Thank you very much. We are running over time, but it's such rich material. Can I ask David and Jerry to sit on those seats? And if you have a burning question for David, if you could put your hand up immediately so we can get a microphone to you. Can we? Yes, thank you. Um, terrific, uh, inspiring speeches. Uh, a question for David. Uh, first hand up. Doral, you've got David. A question for Jerry. First hand up. First hand up for Jerry. Yes, and we have the question for Jerry there. Thank you. Um, Jerry. <laughs> oh, your question's for Jerry? <laughs> you, you subverted the system there. You um, radical, you. <laughs> yes. Um, mosaic planting. Okay. Can you explain that? Um, one of the, the joys of working on garden in Australia was filming a farm at Gundagai and we did this about two and a half years ago and they were one of 300 farms which the uh, National University had been doing a study with on low-till farming and they had five uh, key areas where farms can improve their bottom line, become more sustainable and make bigger profits by spending less on inputs. And having a mosaic was one of the ways that they suggested that conventional farming could be beyond its dependence on the honeybee and be encouraging native uh, predators, biocontrols, to take an active part in controlling crop pests. And that idea was having a mosaic of fields in the landscape rather than just prairie farming from one horizon to another. And that mosaic was made up by not planting green corridors, which have been proven to be a failure, um, but by using large blocks which are revegetated. And that idea of different types of crops in smaller paddocks was one of the ways that they used to use livestock for crash grazing instead of using herbicides. So the animals, the movement of the animals is part of weed control and all sorts of other things, but the idea is not just to do prairie farming, 
but to make sure that there is a range of different things growing next door to each other so you can take advantage of watersheds for flood control, taking control, using animals to control weeds, all sorts of different things like that. And that was that's the, the basic idea of, of mosaic farming. And the ANU are the pioneers of this, this five-step process. Thank you. And the next question? To whom Sorry, are you uh, asking? It, is that on? Yeah. It's for the Jerry question. again. Sorry. Okay. Hi. Um, I, I work with two extremes of the industry. I work with local growers on the southern Moreton Bay Islands there trying to improve local food growing. Can you growing. put the microphone a little bit closer to you? Sorry, yeah. Thank you. I also work for the uh, uh, Grains Research and Development Corporation. So I work with broadacre farmers. Uh, and I guess what I w was really asking you is your ideas on changing systematic processes in the broadacre area. We've got incredibly well-informed farmers out there that they're very, very uh, smart. They're using e extremely smart technologies, but they're plugged into systems that are non-sustainable. Uh, you know, the idea of fully no-till on those large acreages is, is a fantastic idea, but um, I wonder how you would see we, we would move as a, as, a, as a community towards those more sustainable systems. Well, I think the, the, the models that have been developed by the ANU are the vehicle for doing just this. And what they do is that they engage with the costs, um, the operational costs of farming and dismantle the argument by using economics. That's the strength of the work that Dr. David Lindenmeyer has done so that he can actually forecast the, um, the results of all, all these measures which adopt conservation as part of the strategy. It doesn't mean that you have to go cold turkey and you stop using your tractor, you stop using herbicides, you stop spraying and you, you basically become an organic farmer. It's a, a very gentle progression. And uh, King Cora was the farm that we filmed for Gardening Australia. They've adopted three out of five of those strategies. And it's that staged approach which makes a difference. And it's if you use simple things, the simplest change for that farmer was to use smaller blocks. And once he was able to see how he could use crash grazing to control weeds and to allow it to regenerate native grasslands and to understand that native grasslands in turn could uh, control weeds by suppression, and that they were actually more adaptive to rain when it falls out of season. And that's one of the key things, that native grasslands are really good at unseasonal rainfall. Once he could see that process in action with some examples around the farm, he could move from examples on the farm to whole of site ad adoption. And that's why they work with 300 farmers, because they were the people that put up their hands in Victoria, New South Wales, and Queensland to take those principles into, into hand. And they've now produced a whole body of evidence, and they're quite happy to engage. That's the route. What, what I loved about that story was what I'm talking about doing from a home gardener's perspective can be rolled out into smallholders very easily, and with time into major sort of prairie farmers like grain growers. And uh, may I suggest you catch up with Jerry as you grab morning tea for further details on that. Do we have a question for David because, yes, thank you Sheila. Uh, yeah. uh, yes, <coughs> David, I loved your analogy with the human health issue. Um, I'm wondering, is your presentation available anywhere and how does one get involved in Doctors for the Environment? Do you have regular meetings? Or um, what? I'm not sure about the access of slides. I'm happy to share them. Um, I guess uh, the conference will have a policy on, on that. Um, I've just uh, uh, extracted my slides from a, a set that DAA has put together that I helped to put together for them. Um, so ha quite happy to share. How does one get involved? Go to the website and sign up. Um, mm. Queensland, people in Queensland don't really like to get involved with things as much as, as some of our other states do. I'm not just talking about the environment I'm generally. <laughs> um, it's hard to, I guess what I'm saying is um, we're still trying to 
Um, I've been chair for 13 years and I'm still looking for someone to, to take over from me so I can do other things. I need to talk to you about my group. We could swap roles. Um, but yeah, you can certainly come and talk to me afterwards. And, um, Terrific. Thanks for that. Let's show our appreciation for two wonderful presentations. Now, moving right along, we are behind time, but we're going to catch up on time. We are now going to move into the workshop phase, and I'm going to get Lois to give a brief introduction to what the actioneer's uh, role is in the workshops. We have facilitators of the workshops. You signed up for a workshop either today or yesterday or when you went online. If you haven't, uh, as we break, you need to go and look at what workshops are available and who's running them at the front desk. Uh, the actioneers are the people who attend workshops who will then sign on to be mentored uh, through a closed Facebook site for the specific issue you want to be an actioneer on. Is there anything else about actioneers you want to say, Lois, quickly? Yes, just very, very quickly. I just, we just want people um, who feel inspired to take some action to actually put their name on this form that's in every uh, seminar room um, and hopefully our facilitators will encourage people to do that and once you've done that then we'll be able to contact you to put you into that um, closed Facebook and we need at least one definite action from each workshop. Thank you. Okay. So um, the action is you don't have to attend meetings uh, in someone's house or a hall, you can do, it'll be contact online and mentoring online. And the workshop groups, the scribes, the volunteer scribes, are to get one major priority action, that is the key one that that uh, workshop group feels is the major one. You may have other ones that are also on your list, which is fine to document, but you're to come back from the workshops with the major priority action that your group wants to be involved in. Um, the workshop groups are this. If you want to do Fiona Armstrong Climate and Health Alliance, it's an orange colour on a, um, a wonderful species of animal on a paddle board that the volunteers will hold up. So it could be a turtle, it could be an eastern curlew that roosts on Curlew Island in our Broadwater. It could be a, um, a, a Queensland groper, protected, uh, lives in our seaway. Um, so orange is Fiona Armstrong Climate and Health Alliance. Heather Boeto, social worker at Charles Sturt University, is the yellow paddle. Sally Gillespie, psychology for a safe climate, is the green paddle. Uh, Rob Pekin, Food Connect, is pink. Roman Spur, local sustainability, is purple. Dave Forrest, organic farming, is blue. So those are the colours you're looking for for the workshops you go to. Now, we're going to subvert the system. We would have gone to the workshops without morning tea and come back and probably have to come straight back into the lecture theatre for the 11 o'clock panel, but we're going to be flexible. Grab a plate of food and a coffee or tea now. Don't stop and chat. You'll have a chance at lunchtime. Grab your plate of morning tea, coffee uh, or tea and go to your workshop. The people with the paddles will be in the foyer. Follow your colour after you get your cuppa and your morning tea. Thanks very much.